And the reason I'm saying this is, if you look at other countries and how they have progressed, if you look at some of the Western democracies and you look up, look up to them as to how well they are organized and how well they are run, they've taken hundreds of years to get there. So let me give you an example. When the US as a country was about our age in terms of as an independent country, about 75, 80 years old as an independent country, in their Senate, they used to have fist fights. They used to have wrestling matches. They used to throw inkwells, reminiscent of what we do, in fact, worse than what we do today. Now, why am I citing this example? I'm citing this example because today, if you look at the US Senate, if you look at the US House of Congress, they are the very epitome of grace, very epitome of following debating rules, the very epitome of not interrupting far from tussling with each other physically. They discuss ideas. That's what democracies ought to do. What happened? What happened is that at the end of the 19th century and the beginning part of the 20th century, the US changed as a country. And some of those changes are exactly what we are experiencing today. And that's why it's relevant. That's why I'm mentioning it to you. During the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, the US transitioned from being primarily an agricultural rural society into primarily a manufacturing urban society with the largest percentage of the population becoming middle class. And this is important. Why is it important? Because when the middle class becomes large, and in India it's growing, but still not the largest part of the population, that's when politicians will pay more heed to what matters to the middle class. What matters to the middle class are virtues of hard work, virtues of merit, virtues of a level playing field for all. Certainly, it's the middle class that is most opposed to the kind of scenes that we see in our parliament. Now, in our country also, over the past couple of decades, we've been growing, as I gave you the example of China, not quite as fast as China, but faster than most other countries. And our middle class has been growing. When people like I grew up, our middle class and the upper classes consisted of a tiny sliver of the population. Today, it's a much bigger chunk of the population. People who buy cars and homes and telephones and motorcycles, people who use the internet. They've gone from a tiny sliver of the population to a much larger chunk of the population. And as this section of the population grows, politics will have to listen to their attitudes. What politicians have to listen to today is significantly different. Now, for example, I represent Kendrapada, nearly 2 million people, very agrarian, very rural. Not that they don't care about what happens in parliament, but they care much more about certain other basic things that many of us take for granted. They care much more for how to ensure that they continue to have three meals a day. They care much more how to get proper clean drinking water, which is a challenge for many of them. They care much more that they would have teachers regularly attending the schools where their children go to school. It's a challenge. Difficult for those of us who've gone to, and this is such a phenomenally great school. I'd heard so much about it, and I am so impressed to be here today. But we must recognize that many parts of the country aspire to having schools where only teachers show up, because they don't most of the time. So if that is the concern of millions and hundreds of millions of our citizens out there, obviously that is what MPs and MLAs and politicians will focus on, not parliamentary propriety, which is less of a concern to most of our citizens. But as affluence grows in the, in the country, as people start growing into the middle class, values change. The demands they make of their politicians change. And as that changes, we will see the same kind of changes that the US saw, that the UK saw, that other countries saw. Now, I don't want to talk at length about that, although I could. I'll address it in Q&A if any of you have questions. But I want to start concluding my talk 
by talking about youth. One of the biggest oddities in our politics is that the demographics of our politics is exactly the reverse of the demographics of the country. You probably have all heard that our country is a young country. About half our population is relatively young, in their 20s or less. This is quite rare, actually. If you look around the world, most countries have the opposite problem. They have a much larger, older population, and their challenges are very different. Now, ironically, it is in our country, where the demographic profile is very young, that most of the politicians are not young. If you look at the age profile in parliament, it is more or less an inverse of the age profile of our public out there. And why is that? It is because even though we are a democracy, even though we listen to our people, our systems aren't as open to everyone. Not anybody who wants to become a politician can easily get in. Any of you can aspire to be an engineer, to be a physicist, to be a doctor, to be anything. But it's much harder to become a politician unless you have connections, unless you have relations. We need to change that. Until, unless we change that, our democracy will not live up to its fullest potential, where our politicians, where our system truly listens to our population and plans its policies according to what the population wants. Not that we don't have it. We do have it in part, but we need to take it a bit further forward. I want to, the last few things I want to tell you is this. Winston Churchill once said, democracy is the worst system out there, except for all the other systems. That's what I've been trying to tell you. Democracy is not perfect. But every other system out there which has been tried for thousands of years is worse. But what democracy requires for it to truly fulfill our aspirations is for the citizenry to be involved. Who's the citizenry? It's you and I. Now, in concluding, I want to tell you one thing. I was being asked by your fellow students in a Q&A before I started as to why I got involved in politics. I got involved in politics because I used to complain about the system and my friends told me to stop complaining and do something about it. One of the things I want to tell you is that we all have the right to complain about the system because this is a democracy. There are countries out there where you cannot complain. Some of the countries that I've named, I've been there, and even in three days, without Twitter, without Google, without Facebook, without the right to complain, it feels like there's lack of oxygen in the room. We have the right to complain, but along with rights, we have obligations. And my feeling and my request to you is you should have no right to complain until as soon as you are able to vote, at least you vote. Citizens' involvement, citizens' engagement is crucial in a democracy. I don't want to make it compulsory. In a democracy, you don't want to make anything compulsory. But if at least you don't vote, you should not have the right to complain. Many of you are nearing or are already at voting age. The rest of you soon will be. Please do take this seriously. We cannot change the country. We cannot improve the country unless all of us gets involved. Last thing I want to tell you is I request you all to champion one cause. Pick anything that you want to improve about the country. It doesn't have to be about politics. I, I champion several causes. One of them is uh, I campaign against tobacco. Tobacco-related health dilemma in our country leads to more than a million Indians dying, more than 100,000 crores of wasted money by people who can't afford it. You could champion a movement against tobacco. You could champion a movement for women's safety. You could champion a movement for better infrastructure, for better schools, for better drinking water, for anything at all, for easier access to the internet. And currently, a debate that's going on is that the internet must be kept neutral, net neutrality. Pick a subject of your choice. I urge you all, you don't have to go out there and face water cannons at India Gate but at least 30 minutes a week. Champion it on Facebook. Champion it on Twitter. Write emails. 
make phone calls, pick one issue, 30 minutes a week is all that I ask of you. Any issue of your choice, champion it. If you do it, I can assure you, by the time your kids are sitting in this hall, at some point in the future, this will be a far, far, far better country. I can give you examples of some of this that's already happening. Thank you. And with that, I conclude my talk. And if any of you are still awake, I'll answer your questions. So early on in your talk, you said that uh, in many areas of our country, barely any teachers show up to school. How do you suggest that we stop that and make our rural areas more educated? That's a, that's a very good question. Now, one of the things that has happened in our country is that over the past 68 years, government has taken upon itself to do everything. Government, of course, traditionally has run schools, but government also started running airlines, started running hotels, started running other things. And that is a diversion of its focus, whereas government really ought to focus on delivering quality, basic services to its citizenry, such as education. So it's very odd, and this is interesting. Uh, most of the schools are government schools where the teachers are relatively well paid, and yet, because of governmental systems being lax, they are not able to enforce discipline. They are not able to make sure teachers land up there. What is ironic is it's becoming clear that many private schools are doing very well. Not just superb private schools such as this one, Vasant Valley, but even if you go to uh, rural areas, you'll find not very well off private schools. They don't have great facilities. The teachers actually get paid less than government school teachers. But the results of the kids are far better. Now, I think it's a question of parents being involved. I think it's a question of accountability. Government systems are not easily accountable. There are many efforts out there to try to improve accountability in government schools and also to provide alternatives. I'll leave you with a thought. One thing that's being debated out there is the concept of vouchers. Vouchers means now, government today runs a school, let's say a rural school. They spend a lot of money on it, buildings, facilities, good teacher salaries, and they're not accountable. And one of the ideas is, instead of government doing that, government should give vouchers to the parents for X rupees every month, which they can use in any school. They can go to a private school. They can go to a government school. Whichever school is doing better for their children, they have choice. This is an idea that doesn't, doesn't have full support from everybody, but a lot of people are supporting it. And I encourage those of you who have an interest in this to read up on it a little bit. Is school vouchers the right idea? Possibly. Can we improve government school accountability? Perhaps. We ought to think and talk about these issues. So, uh, how much money can you tell with the politician? Uh, with the? With a politician. <clears throat> this is a, an excellent point. Uh, Mr. Seth's question was, how does one intern with a politician? Now, I, I will give a little background first. Our political rules need a little bit of changing. Now, I've written some articles about this. Any of you who are interested can Google it and read them. But basically, many of our rules were designed before 1947 by the British when our parliament was set up by the British Raj just to give a little bit of space to the independence movement. But real power was kept with the British Raj. Now, there are many aspects of this which are today hampering our parliament. And we can I don't want to take up the whole discussion on this, but do read up on it. One of the aspects that is handicapping us is those British era rules where parliamentarians have no facilities. They don't have an office. They don't have staff. Now, if you go to the US, if you go to the UK, if you go to Australia, you'll find parliamentarians have between 20 and 30 qualified staff. Because the kind of paperwork that we have to read, the number of people that we have to meet, the kind of concerns that we have to follow up. My constituents getting stuck in uh, Syria, I have to follow up with the government to make sure they come back, is one example. And somebody else at a rural hospital is not getting attended to. 
I have to uh, respond. So this aspect of why should we expect our politicians to perform unless we equip them with the facilities to help them perform leads to this question. Fortunately, in the last few years, there, ha there is an ecosystem that's developing. NGOs and others have been providing fellowships to get bright young people to intern with politicians. So one of the best known uh, is called the LAMP Fellowship, Legislative Assistant to Member of Parliament. It's run by PRS Legislative, originally funded by the Ford Foundation, now funded domestically, but you need to be a college graduate to apply for it. It's become very, very popular. And like the LAMP Fellowship, there are other fellowships also. And you can also directly uh, apply. I've had both uh, people that have just graduated from school, as well as college graduates, as well as even young professionals, come and intern in my office for periods of between a month to three months. And that's becoming increasingly popular among many uh, MPs as well as political offices. So I, I get about 10 requests uh, every week. And obviously, we are not able to accommodate everyone. But if you have an interest, it will be a great learning experience, perhaps during your summer vacation, to spend a month at a politician's office to see how she or he deals with constituents, deals with policy issues. You can directly write. All the MPs have email now. You can directly write. Uh, I do take in, so if anybody is interested, you can apply to my office as well. But as I said, I do get a lot of requests. I can only take in very few during a year. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think the intention behind it is, uh, is laudable. I'm not sure it's going to be a workable system. Those who couldn't hear, the question was, there was a court order yesterday uh, in Allahabad, I believe, High Court, which says that the children of government officers should study in government schools. Now, uh, you know, I, I have often railed against the so-called VIP culture in our country, and I have often argued that if VIPs don't get stranded in traffic, traffic is never going to improve. If VIPs don't have to go through the airport security, airport security will never improve. If you go to the best countries in the world, the northern European countries, for instance, they don't have a VIP culture. Their public personalities use the same facilities that everybody else uses. Now, this is in that same spirit. The spirit is, that if government officers' children don't go to government schools, they'll never improve. But I'm against the idea of compulsion. I, even though I want everybody to exercise their vote, I'm against the idea of compelling people to go and vote. I'm against the idea of compelling uh, government uh, officers to forcibly send their children to a government school, although that would indeed improve the government school, I can tell you that. How do we do this? There are ways we can do this without compelling. There are ways we can do this. Uh, we were discussing a little bit earlier about school choice. Now, the government spends money on schools, which are not running well. And the government spends money on government officers' children to go to better schools. School voucher would solve the problem. So what the government is currently doing for its officers' children, it should do to all citizens. To all citizens, it says, here is x rupees a year, which is good enough to take you to the best local school or to the local government school. That will arguably solve some of the problem. School vouchers have been tried in some countries. They have had mixed success. I think it's worth trying in our country as an alternative to compulsion. Oh, it's oh excuse me, sir. Uh, sir, so you introduced a bill in the Lok Sabha in 2013, which was a private member's bill. It was the, on the Comptroller Auditor General of India. And so it was equipping the CAG with more power than it already has to solve the cases which are pending before it. But the CAG in the coal scam and under other investigations as well has come under the criticism that it's questioning government policy on very various issues. So don't you think that equipping the CAG with more power 
would undermine the bureaucracy and the, pol the political level leaders to actually frame policy that is in the larger interest? That's a great question. Um, let me answer it this way. Any society, any government, and particularly a democratic system, needs to have more sunshine. The more sunshine that we shine on non-transparent parts of governance, the better governance we will get. But you've touched on a very valid issue. Should auditors be questioning policy, or should they only be looking at malfeasance, corruption? Very valid point, because I strongly believe that if a government has got elected on promising a certain policy, they ought to have a degree of freedom with only reasonable questions and checks and balances to implement that policy. So yes, I agree with that. But what has happened in our system, <coughs> excuse me, what has happened in our system is basic norms of honesty have often been vitiated. Now, in my bill, if you would see, I've, there are nuances in there which, which stipulate that as far as policy decisions are concerned, the government ought to have a free hand. Now, you mentioned coal and spectrum. Now, you know, in, in, in spectrum, the government can definitely have its own policy. But what it should not have is its own bouncers standing there to ensure which favored person can put in his bid and which disfavored company cannot put in his bid. That is the level to which we had descended. And that needs to be sorted out. But your question is very valid. We must have more checks and balances. But on policy issues, elected governments ought to have greater free hand. Uh, microphone here, please. Hello. Um, so my question is, uh, you've spoken a lot about, obviously, the contribution of youth to the government, right? So um, uh, I was asking, like, all of, most of us, like quite a few of us, know that uh, what all is going on in the, go in the government and the corruption. And, and we want to, like, you know, stop it and, like, improve it. I mean, the government. But um, so how would you suggest we do that? Because obviously, you just said that the internships start from you know, colleges and like um, at least school graduates. And, like, how would we contribute to it? Like, there's a limitation. Uh, most of the internships are available for college graduates and young professionals. But as I mentioned, there are some uh, uh, people that are that have just graduated from school and have not yet gone to college who are also doing short-term internships. I've had one or two in my office. And if any of you are interested in small numbers, I can I can accept some. Uh, but you've raised a very valid question. What can we do about it? Now, often what we find in the media and the discussion is mostly about the uh, symptoms. Very rarely do we go into the root cause which is causing all of this. Now, one of the root causes of corruption is that political funding in this country is completely opaque, or not com but mostly opaque. It's non-transparent. Now, we need to make that transparent. I have championed certain issues. If you feel strongly enough about this, I urge you to champion it. Let me tell you what I mean. In our country, donations below 20,000 rupees don't have to be accounted for. So guess what? All political parties show millions of donations of 19,900 rupees. That is not right. Now, what we need to do, we have had a different approach in this country of stipulating limits on political expenditure. And I'm talking about political expenditure because it is one of the root causes of corruption. It leads to a lot of other corruption. If we can tackle some of the root causes, we'd have dramatic improvements in corruption. So I have been arguing, and many of my colleagues, some of my colleagues, that rather than trying to cap the political expenditure, other, other democracies don't do that. Most of them don't. You should focus on the legitimacy and traceability of the funds. If, if one of our IT billionaires has legitimately earned a lot of money, paid taxes on it, wants to get involved in politics, wants to spend his own money. He should be allowed to, as long as the money is traceable and legitimate. Just like in other countries, Mitt Romney did that in the US with his own money. But he couldn't beat Barack Obama, who was not a billionaire, but who sold his ideas to millions of people. 
and actually outspent people like Mitt Romney because he got millions of $10 donations, not 10 $1 million donations. That's the key difference. So if you look up on the net, you'll find my proposals, which I've made to the Law Commission and the Election Commission. I've said the following things. I've said, let's reduce, instead of 20,000 rupees, let's make it 500 rupees. It's because it genuinely happens when people come to rallies, somebody gives 100, 200 rupees just to promote the political party that they support. So let's make it below 500 rupees. It need not be accounted for. Somebody can come and give a cash donation. Above 500 rupees, it should be traceable. The name and the PAN number and the Aadhaar number should be there. Who has donated? More than that, political parties get tax benefits. I have proposed they should only get tax benefits for the traceable funds that they get, not the untraceable funds. Third thing I have said, if let's say you want to get involved in politics, as soon as you are 18, if you are able to rally support in your neighborhood and you want to contest, for every rupee of traceable money that you can raise, I propose that government should give matching funds so that it levels the playing field. Any average person who is, has zeal to improve the system and is passionate about improving the system should be encouraged by a system which encourages legitimacy and traceability of the money. And if we can bring some of these changes in, you'll see fairly dramatic improvements in corruption. Thank you, Mr. Panda, for that very inspiring interaction. We would like to uh, present to you a token of our appreciation. Uh, we will now be breaking for lunch. I would like to request only the and coming back on time. Um, in five minutes, Mr. Chand will be joining us to continue with the voices in Wasant Valley. And I'd request all of you to please keep quiet till then and maintain order. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today we have with us Mr. Unmuk Chand. Unmuk Chand is a professional cricketer and is the current captain of the India A team. He has also led our country in the under-19 category. He plays for Delhi in the domestic circuit and for Mumbai Indians in the IPL. Mr. Chand had led India to glory in the under-19 cricket World Cup of 2012. Not only did he marshal his troops with strategic acumen of a veteran, but also rose to the occasion when it mattered most. He made his first class debut for Delhi at the age of 17. Not only is Mr. Chand a professional cricketer, but an author as well. He penned down his memories of the Under-19 World Cup in his book, Sky is the Limit. Today, Mr. Chand is here with us to talk about the lessons learned from sports. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. Chand to come and address us. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, it's a privilege to be here at not one of the best schools, but the best school. I think I, uh, after accepting the invitation <laughs> from Vasant Valley, I, I was reading a few articles in Vasant Valley, and then I got to know that the C4 and the World Education Magazine has rated as it rated Vasant Valley as the best school in the country. So, of course, being a modernite, I should be saying this, but you know, facts are facts. So, thank you so much for calling me here. It's it's a, it's a it's really nice to be here and speaking on sports, of course sports is my forte and I have been playing this game, this game of cricket for the last so many years since I was six, I started playing this game. I really love this game and I'm really happy that this sport has taught me so much uh, about life, about myself. I think self-awareness is very important and um, I really look forward to, of course, doing good uh, for the country and then in the future, my dream is to play for the country and I'm really happy and uh, I'm really motivated to do well for the country. I've got a few points. Uh, of course, speaking about the condition of sports in, in our country, uh, you know, 
I think sports has really become a career now. Ten years back, if if anyone would have thought of sport as a career, people look at look would would have looked at that person with skeptical eyes. But now that's not the case. I think with I think media has a great role to play in this, and with the for, you know formation of so many leagues in our country, it's it's really bringing the sport to a next level. Be it kabaddi, be it ISL, there are tennis leagues. IPL is of course there. So I think it's it's a great uh, it's great that sports is moving a notch higher. And uh, recently, my India matches were also uh, telecasted live on TV. So I mean, ten years back, no one would have thought that these matches were would also be telecasted. So it's it's good that sports is is moving to a uh, to the next next level. Still, I think uh, certain things need to be done in terms of uh, athletics. I think you know due respect has to be given to the athletics players, and of course. Uh, I think we can do even more uh, in terms of that. Next, I'll I'll come to my own experience, and I think that is that is uh, what I should be talking more about. I think sports has has really taught me a lot, and one thing which which it has uh, taught me, which is is patience and hard work. I think nothing you can't achieve anything in your life without hard work. That is that is for sure. And one thing is that patience is is really crucial. I mean, sports teaches you so much. you go through ups and downs every day it's really good to be when you're in a high when you're scoring runs when you're doing well but equally you know you'll face times when you when you don't do well when you fail so that is a time when your actual test of character is 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 you you have to show that character and you know come back come up from come back from that failure and show what you're made up of and it i think uh we all have abilities and we have to believe in our abilities and and this this goes on for everyone if each one of you probably will will cert will face certain situations in life where i mean you you don't know what to do you're working hard still you're not getting the results but then at last i think it's really important to stay patient and keep working hard day in and day out as we all say excellence is not an act it's a habit so it's 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 an everyday process keep doing that that's what i i do and what i feel is when i go through such patches lean lean patches the best thing the trick is to to keep learning i think when you when you learn then you take failures and positives equally and then you you move ahead in 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 your in your journeys and the second thing which i would like to share is 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 priorities i mean you know it's not been long since i was sitting there and uh, you know listening to one of these lectures happening in my school and you know i had my friends i so you know priorities are there i think it's really important at this age to choose the primary things which are most important to you and not the secondary and, ter- and the tertiary things what what we end up doing is most of the times we you know miss we, we don't spend much of the time doing the primary things which are very important for us for our for our careers but we spend time doing those secondary things which are not that important so it's really important to be very strict with yourself discipline with yourself then i think you you you'll go in the in the right direction third thing and the last thing i i won't take long is 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 dreams i mean everyone i i it's it's really important to dream and i i know that each one of you have big dreams in your in your in your life and you want to achieve laurels for your country for yourself for your parents and uh, so just dream dream big it's 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 like we used to we were, we were taught that it's one love one dream it's it's one legacy you would like to leave behind in in the future and at the same time then there are two forces yin and yang so these two forces complement each other it's like dark and light dark and light so it's it's like fire and water so these are complementary forces which you need to choose upon third is the choices the optimal choice the suboptimal choice and indifference i mean up op- optimal choices putting in all your efforts into one direction giving your everything to achieve that one dream sub optimal choices you give your everything you still you know you you give some some part of it you're not totally involved and then indifference is you're doing nothing for it and the fourth is it's these are four doctors we used to say it's doctor diet doctor quiet doctor movement and doctor happiness doctor diet is of course we all need to have take good diets it's really important to be healthy from within doctor quiet is spending time with yourself your me time even this ruckus happening all all around it's really important to have that 10 minutes for yourself where you think on where you're going where you're where your de- where your life is taking you to and to achieving those things 
Doctor movement is doing those physical activities, running around, doing things so that you're he you're healthy. If you're fit physically, then of course mentally fit mental fitness of course comes in. And then there's doctor happiness. It's really important to be happy and it's really important to enjoy whatever you're doing. Otherwise, there's no, there's no point of doing anything. So this is a reverse cycle actually. If you do these four doctors correctly, then you'll, and, and, you, and you take the three choices, if you write three choices, and if you, you know, work in tandem with these two forces, then you'll reach your one dream, one goal. And that is, we all are looking forward to. So, you know, I would not like to, you know, I mean, it seems like a monologue, me speaking all the time, so it's, it's like, it's, it will be good if you can, you know, we can interact and probably, I, I'm sure that you might, might be having a lot of questions and we can, we can share our views on certain things. I'll be, I'll be more than happy. Uh, finally, I would like to say good luck to every one of you. Uh, I think this is, is a great school and it's really, uh, I mean, you, all of you should be proud of being studying in Vasan Valley and uh, hopefully you can do uh, really good for yourself, for your country and make your school proud in the future. Thank you so much. Now the house is open for questions. Please raise your hands or whoever wants to ask any questions to Unmukh Chand, please go ahead. See, of course, uh, it's it's a great privilege uh, for me to be playing under such such people. Uh, I mean, this year I played for Mumbai Indians, and of course, Sachin was there, uh, Ricky Ponding was there, and uh, of course, it takes a few t few days to adjust. You know, you're still in awe of, th of these people, and each personality is very different. I mean, Ricky, he's a very aggressive guy. He was on the, very aggressive on the field. If you have seen his matches, he is the same when he's coaching. He's uh, he's a tough taskmaster make sure that everyone gets equal opportunities you know on the field of the field practice sessions make sure that the practice sessions are hard good inten intensity and sachin is a different character of course he, you know we all know that he's the god of cricket and uh, you get to learn so much from him he has you know loads of information with him he has done so much for the country for himself he has you know played for the, played for the country for 25 years so his his views are different uh, in a way that uh, I mean, he's someone who will look at the even the most, you know, smallest, tiniest thing, which you know, which might go under the carpet for a for a player. But I mean, when you when you spend time with him, you understand that what is the value of those small, small things, which are really crucial in in the long term. So what I learned uh, from him is is nothing is uh, you sh you shouldn't take anything lightly. Everything is important, even the basic, the most simplest thing is important, and it's it's. The most simple things are the most difficult things to do. So this is one of the one of the things I learned from Sachin, and uh, I mean also it's 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 brilliant to be working under uh, you know playing under him, and uh, hopefully I look look to play under him even more in the future. So at what age do you develop an interest in cricket and? Uh, when did you uh, take it, uh, follow it seriously? See, I was very passionate about this game from the very young age. From, I think, five or six, I started playing this game, first in my colony, of course. And then uh, I remember taking my, I, I was living in a joint family that time. So my uncle and my father, I used to wake them, at, uh, wake them up at five o'clock in the morning. And we used to go to a park, they used to bowl me. And that's how it all started. And then eventually, when I used to play in my society, I used to break glasses and everything, so my neighbors, everyone, they told my dad to send me to a proper academy and let me uh, start training un under some un uh, under a coach and like that. So that's how the journey started. And from the very beginning, I was very sure that I want to become a cricketer. As in, uh, I used to say that I'll become a Ranji Trophy player at least. I used to say that, you know, that time. I did not know what it takes to be a cricketer, but I just, you know, I w that was a feeling inside me and I always, uh, played this game very seriously. I enjoyed this game. But, you know, the, there's a problem what happens is many of the other players who were playing with me, there was a problem of academics with them. And many people keep asking me about academics, so I'll, I'll probably say this. 
my both my my parents are teachers so of course i had this atmosphere at home where there were studies uh, and i used to study every day for 2 hours irrespective of i'm playing cricket or not so the routine was very fixed i used to go for early morning swimming i used to swim that time for 6 for six, from 6 to 8 i was in dps noida that time and uh, i did my schooling and then came back home used to go for my 3 hours of practice come back and then study for 2 hours again so this was a, like a routine for me so this is how i never missed on to my studies as well so there was uh, no doubt about me concentrating on my studies more on my cricket more so there was always a balance so that's why i never had any problems regarding academics and regarding things that i have to give more time to academics or studies or or cricket so it's, it was always a balance and i always loved playing this game eventually when i played for the for the under 15 state for delhi and then i went on to score lots of runs in the under 16 played for the india under 16 team under 19 got in the under 19 side then i became sure that yeah this is the path where i where my future lies and this is where i have to put in my everything so you know that clarity comes with with time and after 9th i believe i i was totally into this game and was giving my everything to it so what significance does the upcoming ranji trophy season hold for you are you a cricket player yeah, uh, yeah. that's why <laughs> see all seasons are very important uh, i think you can't right now i think every opportunity given to me is really important because i'm here to play for the country not play for the country till now and uh, uh, of course i'm knocking the doors but right now it's it's time for me to break the doors now and every match i play is really important for me and i i don't take any match lightly now because of course you can't mess up with your career and this is very important so of course i and i i know that i put in so much of efforts on the field so i can't be taking it lightly so of course any any match that comes up even it's a practice match i take it very seriously and it's it's not that and ranji trophy is of course very important yeah good afternoon sir afternoon sir could you please share with us uh, your sir can you please share with us your views when you were captaining india a and under 19 team uh i mean it's 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 lovely that i could uh, i got a chance to lead the under 19 side and of course the india a side as well and uh, of course there's a lot of lot of memories in the under 19 thingy uh, it was a long journey for us we started as 15 people from different states i mean it took time for us to become those 15 members we had we had camps every year from 16 to 19 we used to have one one month camps we used to have matches and then we were selected so of course it's it's, a, it's a, it was a long journey and for under 19 cricketer the the winning the world cup is the most important thing so i mean we were a great bunch of players who were not only playing on the field but we were a great family otherwise we had become so close to each other that we knew each other we knew each other so so well it had become a family and uh, we wanted to do something for the family there was so much of belief in us i mean even about the book i had written 80% of the book before the world cup and there was no sense in getting it published if we lost the world cup so this you know we were so strong in our belief that we'll go on and win the world cup so and and we eventually did so this is something which which really teaches us that uh, i mean if you are very sure about something it will happen it will happen so there's there's no looking back never thought if we lose you know this thought was never there so i mean in every each one of you also be it you want to become a sportsman in anything whatever you want to do you want to become a doctor just don't doubt yourself it's it's really important to not doubt yourself and have that believe in yourself that you will go and achieve what you what you really want and it it does come true india is is a different story india a uh, i mean eight of the players were playing for the country uh, when i led the india a side against uh, sri lanka and in australia and south africa so uh, it's a totally different bunch of boys of course most of so many of them are playing for the country and uh, you don't have to do too much because everyone is so experienced that i mean they all know what their roles are you just need to have a good good balance in the team 
and uh, know each other well, a good camaraderie, and I think that is good enough to, to you know, win win series, win a series like this. And uh, uh, I know we 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 lost in the in the first two first three first two matches, but then we knew that we'll come back. We were getting into the groove. It takes time for us to you know adjust. Australia won the first two matches. They've been playing together for 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 a long time. One month they were playing, uh, they were there in the four day matches as well. It took us time to adjust, but then we eventually knew that. Uh, if we if we can execute the plans really well, what we had planned, we'll go on to win win the finals, and that's what happened. So it's it's a, it's a great journey. It's it's a great uh, opportunity for me to to play uh, and lead uh, India A in the under 19 sides. Thank you so much. Thanks. I want to ask one thing. Are you all sports people or majority, other, huh? majority. majority of us? Okay, all right. Sir, how do you feel when you get out on a low score? See, that's what I told you. I think cricket is something with, with you know, there's so many highs and lows in the game. In, in, in every game, of course, if you're playing any other sport as well, you might not succeed all the time. So it's really important to keep that balance. Because I know, I really get very frustrated when I get out. And what that frustration does to me is, I, you know, I tinker with my next match as well. Because I'm thinking so much, thinking so much that in the next match I am taking my past with me, which really does not make me perform that well in the next match as well. So right now this is this is a this is a learning process for all of us, and I'm also learning to to deal with 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 failures, because failures are part of it. But but in the long run we all will understand that failures are nothing but they are teachers. They they teach you so many lessons. And these failures only take you to the next level. I think it's really important to fail because they, they teach you. Otherwise, if you, if you win, if you win, if you score 100, you hardly think about your game. It's only when you get out on low scores, that's when you really think about your game, think about what's happening. And then you can probably progress and, and uh, you know, make changes in your game and do well. So I try to, you know, 10 mile now, what I've thought for myself is I'll, I'll think on the way I got out for 10 minutes, and then I'll leave it. And then I'll probably go on with the match, and and you know, I'm just not there to bat. You know, I have to feel as well. I have to think about the game as well. Then I'll go on to do my normal activities. I can't just keep thinking about it and and you know, not feeling good. It's really important to feel good. If you feel good, then only you can perform well when you get a chance to bat or ball. So, what were the challenges you faced in becoming the captain of the uh, India A team? Well, no challenges as such. I think all of us were a good, good bunch of cricketers, and we know uh, each other quite well. We've been playing together for the last couple of years. You know, different IPL teams we've been playing, and we've been playing against each other, for each other. So we know quite a bit about each other. So it's not like I was, uh, uh, you know, leading them for the first time, or I was meeting them for the first time. Everyone is very, very friendly. We all know our, our jobs, and, uh, you know, we are. No, of course it's, it's a professional game, and you know all of us have become professionals. We all know what our duties are, and uh, so I think there was no difficulty as such. I really enjoyed the challenge, and uh, I think everyone was was really helpful, and it was a great, great, great experience for me as well. Hi, uh, I have a question which, which I asked of another gentleman earlier in the day. Sir. So, how does one intern with uh, Unmuk Chand? Let's say one is a brilliant cricketer. And once wants to get even better. How does one intern with you? Uh, how do sportsmen mentor future generations? So, sorry, sir. How do how do sportsmen mentor future generations of sportsmen? So of course I am myself uh, in that learning phase right now, and of course I am also uh, getting mentorship from different people from my seniors. And as youngsters, I would uh, as a mentor to them, I can probably you know tell them from my experiences that it's really important to keep keep working hard that's what i said uh, uh, a few minutes back and at the same time have that patience and that belief in yourself because after a certain age i've seen after the under 19s after all these things it's more about how much you believe in yourself how much mentally strong you are because in the end everyone is 19 20 no one is there's not much difference between two cricketers it's how you react in a situation well how well you react in a situation. So that is very important. So I mean, we are taught, you know, you can learn technique to, a, to an extent. After that, it's about execution. 
and we all have that finite knowledge within us. So what I have been doing of recently, which I would also like them to you know, think about, I don't know, I think it's, it's too early for them, but me personally, what I've been doing is, I mean, we all have finite knowledge, but I think at those crucial moments, it's about that infinite knowledge that is there, and that is the intuition which, which really makes you go the next, next step. So I really believe in that intuition and I try to make that intuition work for me, not against me. Because you can't do much when a baller is bowling at a 140 kilometers per hour to you. You can't think that time. You're, it's, it's all about your intuition, your instincts. So it's, it's, it's really important to, for those instincts to take over you. And that's what I have been working on off, le uh, off recently. And as youngsters, you know, I would like to uh, just tell them to keep working hard at the moment. And, uh, you know, just trying to become more aware. I think awareness is very important. This we learned when we were in the under 19 days and uh, we used to go for these NCA camps. So we had the video session, we had bowling coaches, batting coaches, personalized coaches who used to uh, you know, look at those finer points because those finer points, when you, when you start dealing in those things, then you start understanding what your game is, how you're, how you're gonna play that game. And you also start learning about yourself, your own, your own uh, you know, intuitions, your own, uh, the words you tell yourself at those moments. So it's, it's about self-awareness, which, which is very important for any sportsman. Everyone reacts to a situation differently. Some might, someone might you know, respond to a situation differently than I do. So there's no one way. It's about identifying your own way of, of, of going in that path and then, and then following that path, irrespective of, of failures or anything. I mean, you can tinker around a bit. You can see if you can make those changes. But the main thing is to follow your own path. You know, I can't take someone else's path. I can't take a Virat Kohli's path or anyone else's path. I can just believe that my path is gonna take me there. And I just have to follow that with all the devotion I have and keep, keep uh, stay disciplined to this game, keep working hard towards this game, be patient and hope for the best. Thank you. So, thanks. Tough questions, I must say. <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. Uh, how did Rahul Ravid's mentorship help you during the India A series? Uh, of course, I was with Rahul, sir, when uh, I was playing for the Rajasthan Royals last year. So I knew him pretty well. And uh, we have had long sessions before as well. And it was good that he is now again, now he's uh, the coach for the India A and the under-19s. He'll be coaching them. So of course, he's, he's a great, great human being. We all know him on the field, how he has been a great wall for the country. So he's a great human being. He, you know, he's someone who's, a, who's an epitome of hard work, who's very, very down to earth. I've never seen him uh, you know, jumping or doing any sort of a hanky-panky thing. He's very serious, serious guy, I must say. And uh, I mean, there are lo lots to learn from him. He had this open door policy with, with, with us and uh, Anyone had any questions, suggestions, we could, you know, directly ask him without any hesitation. He's, he's a very nice guy, very simple guy, and I really loved uh, spending time with him. <laughs> Tough questions, yeah. <laughs> media, sir. Okay, so we'd like to thank Mr. Chan uh, on behalf of our school for taking out time from his busy schedule and to come and address our school. Now, uh, we'd like to uh, present a token of our appreciation. have Mrs. Priya Paul with us. Mrs. Priya Paul is the director of the APJ Surrender Group. She got a bachelor's in economics from the Wellesley College and went on to complete her studies at the Harvard Business School. Now, Ms. Paul is widely recognized as a pioneer of the boutique hotels concept in India and has transformed the park hotels into one of the nation's most stylish, fun, and warm set of hotels. Ms. Paul is also the recipient of many prestigious awards. In 2011, she was conferred the Padma Shri by the President of India. 
and uh, she has been consistently listed by Fortune India as one of the top 50 female business entrepreneurs in the country. Uh, can we welcome her with a big round of applause? Uh, um, if you would. Students, faculty, um, staff of Asant Valley School, and I think students from um, a few other schools, I can see in some other uniforms. Um, thank you so much for having me here th this afternoon. Um, I know it's kind of the graveyard shift, and I hope you're, you, know, you have enough of energy. Um, I, um, I'm going to keep it, I, I'll keep, uh, make sure that you have enough of questions by the end of it, because I think that's much more uh, fun. So um, I'm, I'm part of a family business. Um, uh, I run a company called APJ Surinder Group, which is a family-owned business. We have 35,000 people. We started in 1910 with um, uh, a business uh, that started with steel and steel manufacturing. Um, our activities no longer uh, have, uh, our steel is no longer part of our activities, but we now have tea plantations and uh, tea brands, shipping, hotels, real estate, retail, and logistics. Um, I have been in the business uh, since 1988. I never knew I was going to be in um, hotels, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about um, what I do uh, in the business. I grew up in Calcutta, uh, studying both in uh, two, two very fine women's girls' schools, really, Loretto House um, and La Martinia for Girls. Um, and I, I you know, had a normal uh, school-going life like, um, like all of you. I never thought that I would, um, I mean, I always knew at the age of 10, at the age of 10, let me say, let me be very clear, I decided that I would work in the family business. Now, I was in a very, um, in a traditional joint family business. Um, uh, you know, the elder, uh, elder family members never really uh, thought of me being in the business or not. But uh, my father and mother actually, there were four of us, uh, two, two sisters and two brothers, and they never really treated us in any um, different way. So um, I was the eldest, and my father encouraged me to do whatever I wanted to do. So being, you know, being in that environment, um, I think, helped me to, uh, I guess, make decisions which then later on my life, I mean, I guess that's the life I'm living. So at the age of 10, I... Um, I decided I'm going to be in business. I didn't know what, where, how, and what I was going to do. Um, but I, I, I worked hard in school. I did a lot of um, uh, activities, leadership, um, things like that, which, which I can think uh, you do too. I went off to Wellesley College in the US. And um, at that stage, I did economics. I had no idea I was getting into business. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I decided economics uh, in between. That was not really for me, and I started doing third world studies and French. Uh, finally, I came back to economics because it was, I had to have a degree. So I did the degree, and, um, and then I thought I'd work on Wall Street for a couple of years, you know, get my feet wet in, um, in something. You know? I mean, and I'm talking about 30 years ago when you know, we didn't have career counseling and didn't have plans. You just, you know, just kind of, some things just happened in the, in the right way for you. Um, so I, I couldn't get a job on Wall Street because there was a um, Wall Street crash. And uh, so I tried, uh, tried my luck a bit. And then my father finally said that, you know, you're doing absolute, you know, you've been wandering around the world for four years. Forget about that. Start working and do, doing something seriously. And I'm going to train you. So, you know, I didn't think that was um, a very exciting option at that time, even though I knew I wanted to be in the family business at some point. But, you know, like all my friends in college, I wanted to go off and, you know, do stuff across the world and then come back to uh, family business when I, when I thought the time was right. So I started working in uh, 1988, and uh, I started um, as a marketing manager of the Park Hotel in New Delhi. And the hotel was new, it was going through a lot of teething problems, and for me that was a great place to learn a new business and also to learn how to work in India. Uh, it was my first job, it still is my only job. Um, and. Um, I just learned a lot by asking questions and asking, you know, dumb questions about everything from plumbing to uh, baking to, uh, you know, how to, how to sell rooms. 
And I, I slowly started uh, managing the operations of the hotel. I mean, I was going through kind of a coaching kind of training under my father. And um, this was happening kind of organically. Uh, when suddenly in 1990, my father was killed in Assam while he was visiting our tea gardens. So overnight, um, we had to grow up. We had to deal with many issues, uh, my mother, brother, sisters, and myself. And uh, from really managing one hotel, which was you know, 220 rooms, quite a large scale of things, uh, overnight I had to ma manage three properties, which were the oldest one is in Calcutta, and then of course in Vishakhapatnam. And um, th because they were much older hotels, they had a different set of problems, obviously had um, new challenges, and um, I, there, there were lots of things to, um, to cope with, uh, you know, apart from the personal issues. Um, and I don't know, I mean, my father had started um, a program to actually look at those hotels and actually the older hotels and, and make them into um, new hotels and you know, bring them up to date. Um, they, you know, when he died, I kind of looked at that program again and I started looking at really what the hotels were. I mean, you know, we were three hotels. At that stage, I mean, you're probably not born. Um, the hotels were, uh, the industry in India was very, very dull. This was like the early 90s, there was, there was no, fantastic, uh, you know, gold rush of the IT sector or manufacturing or anything else happening or even services happening at that time. So uh, the hospitality business was really dull. The Indian economy was really dull. So when you look at your business, you're looking at, um, you know, how, what are you doing and how can you do it better? And is there a different way of doing it? So I really looked at how could I, how, how could I create value? I mean, at that time, there were three properties and, um, and uh, our family decided that that's a business that we wanted to grow because there were long-term prospects um, for growth. Um, so we uh, decided to do, do this program of renovating, rebuilding, and repositioning the park hotels. And that was um, a program that was gonna continue all throughout the 1990s. And I was you know, young, 24, and while I was very clear on roughly where I wanted to go, like all young people, you, I wasn't very clear about how to get there, so I, you know, I was maybe young and reckless and ready to make mistakes, and I had different ideas, which um, luckily my family supported, and they let me go and do what, I, what I, they thought I could do. So um, I had really seen um, hotels, one or two hotels that had come up in the US, and by one of my hotel gurus called Ian Schrager, and I really, loved what he had done and um, and I felt that if for me to to create hotel places and um, so what we did was really um, use design as a differentiator and I can start playing the slides now if it's in a loop and I you know you can come back to me in the questions but but really using design as um, which which no one really had done in India at all and really using design, using working, working with world-class designers, Indian artisans and craftsmen to actually take the whole idea of Indian craft, design, and, and, and contemporize it. So you'll see that in the images, and, and that's, um, that's really been, um, I would say, my passion to, to, and to, to ha finally create hotels that people could relax in and enjoy and not be, not, not be themselves, okay? So uh, we did a lot of, um, um, innovation in terms of actually and differentiation in creating bars, restaurants, and nightlifes. And that really, from the mid 90s onwards, 93, 94, uh, was really the, the way the park hotels came into a market and shook it up and actually created these spaces and um, uh, fun things for people to, uh, to, to, to enjoy. And um, you know, we, we had designers such as Conrad and Partners, Skidmore and Owens. Um, uh, Project Orange, and just a whole host of designers from internationally, as well as from India. But the idea was to actually create these bars, nightclubs, and fun spaces um, where people can relax, because you know, in the 90s and until up to very recently, you know, where, where would young people in their 20s or 30s really go out and uh, have a good time? It was either the, you know, like the a club type of thing, if you were lucky to be members, or it was uh, people's homes. So there was no really in-between space. I mean, that, that space has, of course, dramatically changed in the past uh, uh, 10 or 15 years. So we used, as I said, design as a differentiator, bars, nightclubs, restaurants as a fun space to get local people involved in the hotels. 
And um, the third peg is really, which is important from, from my point of view, is looking at um, contemporary Indian culture. And by that culture, it meant everything from dance to music to um, conversations, but to really providing a space and uh, for people to act, perform, create new works, and, uh, and do things which actually reflected the contemporary Indian culture that we were living in. And that's something that we continue to do. It's not just art shows, but like we have a performing arts festival which goes for six weeks in six cities. And um, it, it pushes the envelope on, you know, it, it, it's not just Bharat Natyam dance, but it's Bharat Natyam and taking it forward. Um, and those are some of them are experimental, some of them are interesting, and, um, and some work. Um, so again, through the, how do we actually then create this um, company? And, you know, really it was actually a change, um, uh, really a change of uh, culture, a change of uh, outward appearance, a change of, um, just so many things that make a company, and w the, the the so one element was um, the communications part of it. So how do we really communicate this? And we actually decided to have lots of events. We didn't have huge budgets, but we actually did communications that were um, that were fun and quirky and maybe irreverent, and actually um, had a different language of speaking to customers, which which we still do. So you know, all our graphic identity on our work is much more uh, creative and. We spend a lot of time and uh, money and effort on the design process of that too. And none of this, and then the hospitality business is all about um, people, and so none of this comes without really working on the people piece. We have 2,500 people plus right now. And we, in from the 90s onwards, the whole real effort was to attract the right talent, um, put people's like, like interesting processes in place, really make the workplace fun. Um, and, I, and I'll give you an example, but um, when we first started one of our hotels in uh, Chennai uh, in 2000, um, you know, we, we have, you know, all hotels have very strict rules about grooming and, you know, short hair and this and that. We had no rules. We said, you please wear a earring or two if you're a man, have long hair, do whatever hairstyle you want, be quirky and be yourself. Because what we were trying to do is create hotels that have an individual that had an individual character, and that questioned what hospitality um, should be and could be. So your people have to reflect that, because if you're putting them in a straight jacket and asking them to go and have fun and let the customers have fun, they're not able to get it, and there's a, there's a big mismatch. So making it a fun workplace, making sure that each um, team member is involved in the whole creative process is a very, very important part of our um, human resource and talent uh, let's say management process. So that is really, really has been key for us um, and part of um, every single conversation that I might have with uh, our team members. So throughout the 1990s, as I said, we had three hotels to start with and um, we um, established them, um, worked on um, really our internal processes, what we stood for for the company and with uh, kind of the profitable growth of those three companies, we then moved on to open um, a few more hotels, uh, Chennai, Bangalore, Navi Mumbai, Hyderabad. But f as I said, for me, the, the important part is the creativity and the, the art and the design, and I never wanted to do hotels that were identical. So each of these hotels, and there are nine in the, in the, big, um, in the big hotel kind of section, have an individual character, have an individual identity, have a, a theme that kind of loosely connects um, uh, the story of the hotel. So for example, our hotel in Delhi uses Vastu Shastra, but done in a very clean, uh, almost minimal way. Um, so it reflects India, but it's not, um, it's not like, uh, what should I say, bright and gaudy. It's a different color, color theme altogether. Our Chennai property is, uh, located on a very famous uh, film studio lot. So we used the idea of film, performance, and theater in the spaces, which um, then reflect um, uh, artwork, as well as the actually the design of the spaces, which make you, uh, make you as the customer, on a, put you on a customer on a stage. Uh, our Calcutta Hotel uses uh, the chakra theme. Um, and, uh, and the ho hotel that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm most excited about is our hotel in Hyderabad. Um, where I wanted to create a, a modern palace. And, um, and just as a palace, you would go from room to room or area to area or century to century, and you know, different kings and queens put their own stamp. Um, 
that's the process of design that we followed. And I, we worked with almost 25 to 27 different um, artists, interior designers, product designers, really to showcase what um, products in India and what, what is possible, not just with craft, but also with the new uh, technology that is available to Indian designers. Um, and it's really when you walk through, there's, there's of course a, 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 uni a, a synergy to all the spaces, but each space is done by a different person. Um, so we, we have, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna try and um, uh, wrap up. But um, so we have now three distinct um, brands in our, in our portfolio. We have the Park Hotels, you see a lot of that up there, uh, which are large hotels. There are 150, 200 rooms, hotels across most of India, um, of, you know, one or two missing places. Um, then we have the Park Collection, which are small 20 to 40 room, truly boutique hotels and unique destinations, um, which are a little more quirky, like a hotel in Goa and something in, uh, we have a Chetanad Palace, say, coming up uh, shortly. So different types of spaces. And what we've newly launched, really to look, look at this new demographic um, of young travelers, is a brand called Zone by the Park. And that's like a design conscious, price conscious um, brand. Um, very, um, it has the essence of the park in the sense that it has a lot of food and beverages, has, it has a great bar and a, and a good local vibe, but it's, um, they're smaller and then smaller cities. So that's something that uh, we've just launched two of them and we have another five opening this year. So I'm personally very excited about that. So really, um, I, I, I'm gonna wrap up now and um, hopefully you'll have some questions um, which will be more fun. Um, I, I, I really wanna leave you with a couple of messages and, um, and, and what, what I feel about this industry. And I, for me, um, what I've really loved in the past, um, 20 something years, is the creativity and the fun that I have every single day. Every day is not, every day is different, and every day I learn something different. And, and I think that's something that I think you all, I would, I would hope and love that you would keep that as you move forward in life. Because I think that zest for learning, that zest for life, is something that you need to take with you. And I think um, all too often we get trapped into you know, what we've become you know, 20 years later or whatever else, but I, I, you know, that's my message to you. Just keep, keep questioning, keep looking at what you're doing, keep saying how I can do it differently. And I think that's, and I, I, I live your life with passion. Thank you. In, your, in the pictures, I saw that all the hotels were really different. So what led you, your family, and your company to such innovative thinking? What led us to that? Yeah. Um, you know, I think in one way, having a, having a upbringing which is open and you're exposed to so much of um, uh, so many new things, and, and, and as I mentioned at the, at, at the end, I mean, I've always felt that I, I'm constantly learning and constantly finding new things. So it's, um, whether it's an interaction with uh, people or it's actually going to a, um, an art show or a fair or something else. So, so I, I, I do that in my daily life. And to me, that uh, that's helps me being innovative. I think it also, also if you keep yourself open to new ideas. And ideas come from all over the place. So um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's. Um, you mentioned boutique hotels. So what is the concept of a boutique hotel? So when I um, started doing, you know, re, re, let's say, configuring these hotels, at that time, um, the, the phrase boutique hotels had just about being used, had begun being used in 1984, 85 in, in the US. And boutique is as the word 
implies is a specialized kind of space, which is a specialized environment, very different to say a supermarket or department store where you get everything. So that's the idea behind, um, by, behind my hotels. In the sense, we, I was not trying to do cookie cutter hotels or do 5,000 hotels. I wanted to create a very specialized and beautiful um, kind of a microcosm of a hotel and a really small, in, intimate space um, where you could relax and be like a normal person. And that was a very, very different um, way of looking at hotels in the 80s. And um, it, it has, have, has had profound impact on hospitality in the past uh, 20 years. Um, and you know, you, now you have all the big companies also coming into that space. So it's no longer boutique as, as size. Uh, I think it's also the attitude of the company and what they're trying to do. So it's not 20 rooms. I mean, there's some boutique hotels that are 400 rooms, but it's, it's the behavior, I would say, and the attitude. Hi. You're not allowed to ask. Sorry? You're not allowed to no, ask. I'm asking you a question which you'd love to answer. What <laughs> makes a great hotelier? Because there are lots of kids here who I know are aspiring mm. to be hoteliers at some stage. So what makes a great hotelier? See, first of all, I'm not a hotelier. So maybe that's um, key. I never studied hospitality. In fact, I, the, the big joke was that I, I did think I should study hospitality because we had hotels. And I applied to Cornell for the hotel management school. I was rejected. And in fact, about two years ago, I went as a guest speaker. They have this speaker for hospitality. They have every year they choose one person from around the world. So it's a very distinguished speaker's thing. And I went there and my opening thing was, you know, like you guys don't know what happened, but, I, but probably you benefited me by, not, by me not going there and being the straight jacketed thing, um, which is what very often hospitality schools teach you. So I think I became a hotelier by accident. Um, I think, um, let's say successfully, because I was able to look at ho hospitality in a different way. I didn't have this set way of doing things which you learn in you know, eight semesters or tw 20 semesters. And I said, okay, fine, why do you have to do it this way? Just because you're a hotel profession. So my, my job, and since I didn't know anything about hospitality, I had to learn everything, was saying, but you're telling me you have to do this like this, but why? Give me a good reason. And you know, you know you've been into m many of those meetings, so. Um, there was no, so I was, because I was raw, fresh, um, from out of the whole industry, I could question it much more, I think. Um, and also when you're, you know, 24 years old, uh, you know, you, you can question anything. And so you made a few mistakes and you made a few right things and then you move ahead. So I, I you know, so I, I, I think a hotelier is really, ha you have to be a people person. I think if that's one big thing, a people person and a team player, um, and you have to be a great leader, so there are many, many things. But um, I don't think you have to go to hotel school to be a great hotelier. Thank you. I have to ask you this question. So which are, which are the three hotels or the two hotels that are your favorites? That's one question. And the second thing is like, you're not only sort of an in, known to be an innovator in the hotel industry, you also uh, are into design, you collect art. So when you are looking at you know, collecting art or design, what are you looking for? What makes you know that this is going to be something that is worth collecting and uh, what you look for? You want me to choose the hotels from my hotels that I like the best or hotels no, in the world? Overall, what is your, if, yeah. non <laughs> hotels. Well, I just did a list for somebody, but um, the the, you know, that keeps on changing with your experience. Unfortunately, if I could just get off and just travel for a few months on an end, maybe I'll come with more, more lists. Um, but let's say one of my current favorites is a hotel called The Nomad in New York, which I love because it's a neighborhood hotel. It's, uh, you know, it's nice enough, it's trendy enough, but yet it, it's very comfortable. Um, and I'm anonymous, so, you know, it's, that's also part of the charm of, uh, of, of being in a hotel. Um, so I like that, and I think from a design point of view, it's, um, it's, it's sophisticated, but yet it's um, a little more to the edge. Um, so I like hotels that speak of good design, so when I go traveling, I'm always looking for something that's new and different, or um, you know, a little bit that, that I can learn from and enjoy the experience. So, but that's one of my current favorites, and, um, and also probably, um, yeah, I like the Amman hotels. Actually, I like a lot of those. From more from a 
you know, refined luxury point of view, which is a, a different aesthetic. So I, I like their, what they do. Um, so how do I choose art and design? That's a very tough question because I think, um, you know, um, there are many collectors here. Um, I think it's more from what I like and I think what I have a passion for and what I enjoy visually. And um, having said that, you make lots of mistakes and, you know, I've collected and, uh, you know, most, a lot of our collection is in storage because not all of it finds a home in, in all the hotels. But it's, um, and I'm not looking at art or design as a financial bet. I mean, from a, from a design point of view, obviously you know certain young upcoming designers and um, established designers whose pieces you want to work and have in your spaces and some who you want to collaborate with. Um, you know, for whether it's a Tom Dixon or it's a, a Clove Design Studio. So um, there are some great practitioners and I think what's, what's really interesting now and in India uh, in terms of the design field, there's just so many good um, young designers who are working with just taking craft or just taking a new kind of idea of what contemporary Indian design should be. So I think that's an exciting space right now. Um, and art, I really think you have to choose what you like and enjoy it if you don't. Oh. Hi. So there are many kids here whose uh, mummies and mothers are working. Yes. What would you advise them to support their mothers as a working mother? We're ah. always telling kids, uh, we're always telling parents, you know, support your children, support your children. You're here to advise the children here how mm. to support their working mothers. Ah, that's good. <laughs> um, I think, you, I mean, uh, hopefully their, uh, their parents started training them for a young age to manage that whole work-life balance for the kids too. Um, I, 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 think, I think it's a question of also respecting each other's spaces. So I know, uh, with, my, you know with my son, you know, okay, fine, I, I try and get home and you know, have some quality time, then I leave him off to do his own stuff and he leaves me to do my own stuff. Um, and it's a, it's a question of constantly communicating, I think. I mean, you know, children need their parents at various stages of their lives. I mean, I only have a 10-year-old right now, so I don't know what, what's going to happen further. Um, but I think even though, you know, you're teenagers, maybe you feel that, okay, fine, you don't need your parents, but at that odd moment, how do you bring that parent back into your life if you've told the parents to get lost? So don't do that to your mother or father because they may be working very hard, but they also uh, are doing that uh, because they want to maybe provide the best or they are challenged by what they're doing at work. So I think what, what you have to understand is that your parent is not just working for, for money or for a job or something, it's, it's for personal fulfillment. And I think that's very important for you as children to realize that your, mo you know, your mother or father is not just doing it to stay away from you, but they're there because they, they need something uh, professionally and emotionally from their jobs. Um, to make them better people. And I don't know, that's a, you know, I, I'm trying to tell my son that, and I think he understands because sometimes I have to do a work trip or whatever else, and they understand, fine, this is important for me. And I think that's what I'm trying to explain. You know, you have to have boundaries and lines. Thank you, that's a tough one though. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, so basically, the hotel industry has a return of only 5.9%. So do you encourage uh, young entrepreneurs to take risk in investing in this industry? So what, what turnover of? The, like the return for the hotel industry is only 5.9%. So do you encourage young on, entrepreneurs in taking risks? You know, it's a very bad business to invest in, actually, because the return on uh, equity is not so high. And I think that's what you've got. But the return on your asset is much higher, I mean, in, in the sense in the long term. So the only people who make money on hotels, fi finally, are the ones who buy and sell properties, okay, and not those big funds that buy the properties and sell it and something else. Us uh, people are in the hospitality business because we love it. Um, and for many people, it's a real estate thing. So I, I'm there because I like it, but if I, if I didn't love it, I wouldn't be doing it. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, yeah. ma'am. I would like to know what were some of your ideologies when you developed, uh, when you established Spark Hotels, and how they have changed over the years, over the course of being a mother and a working parent and such. 
So how's my ideology changed from being a working person with a child or without a child? Is that what it is? Yes, ma'am. You know, uh, I don't know if that makes a difference. Probably I'm working slightly less and maybe more, more efficiently because I have a child. <laughs> but I don't think my ideologies have changed. I think I'm, um, I would like to think I'm the same person that I was 20 years ago. Um, and one of the things, uh, well, actually, let me, let me put it in another way. Say 20 years ago, I was a different person. You have much more energy, youthful ideas, all that sort of stuff. And I think I'm aware that this is a business, and this is a business the way I want to have this business. This is a business that's young and young at heart. So I'm very um, conscious of that, and that's one of the things that we've done in our company, is that to actually embed creativity as part of our, the DNA. And that's really what we try to do with our employees. So it's not just me driving the business, it's the ideas and um, um, uh, innovation that's coming from a 22-year-old who's managing one of my bars. And literally we have young people managing spaces because that gives them responsibility, gives, them, gives us great ideas, and we're right at the edge of what is happening. So uh, you know, my hope is that in two years I'll retire, and then somebody else can run it. Okay, so that's another ideology. <laughs> like you said that most of your hotels are driven by design. Yes. Right. So from among all your hotels, what would you think is one of the most quirky design elements that you've brought in? Or something very unique that you've brought into your hotels as far um, as design is concerned? Well, I, I, I think the last one that I worked on, which I mentioned, was, uh, was Hyderabad. And, you know, I'm, of course, I'm doing the smaller um, zone by the park. But let's say the, the one in Hyderabad, I had a complete blank canvas, um, so to speak, to work from. Um, so whether it was working with lighting designers, uh, you know, designing new light pieces, pieces of furniture, chandeliers. I mean, I think each thing, each individual item, even down to uh, vases, working with master craftsmen who did leather, leather puppetry, but in a completely contemporary language. Um, I think each of those, um, it, it was such an incredible journey for me. So I think for me, that was really, really fantastic. I mean, I've got five other hotels happening right now, but it's not as challenging as doing that one hotel with that, those many uh, designers, both international and um, uh, local. Um, so it's all those quirky pieces. I mean, you'll probably have to go to the website to see those. Um, but it's also using things in, a, in, a, in an unusual manner, like say our hotel in Chennai. I, you know, I don't know if people have been to South India. You get those, what they call gharas over here, brass ones. But in South India, you'll find them in plastic, colored plastic all over. So I just took a whole bunch of them, you know, some 15 years ago, and put them in one of our big windows, like 15 of them. And I got sort of flack from all those Chennai ladies they said, you know, you know, it reminds us of poverty and water. I said, but you know, I'm seeing art in this design piece. I mean, it's a traditional uh, vessel which has been done in plastic and uh, it's colored and it's, it still forms a function and to me that's art. So it's also looking for those um, things that are, that are present in our everyday life and then, you know, is it art, is it design, is it whatever. We thank you for your insights, ma'am. And on the behalf of the Wasit Valley School, would like to offer you a token of our appreciation. Okay, so our last speaker today is Mr. Vijay Nair. Mr. Nair is the CEO of OML, or Only Much Louder, a live music and entertainment conglomerate. He's been the driving force behind some of India's premier music festivals, such as Bacardi NH7 Weekender, the Invasion Festival, which, he which was headed by world's number one David Guetta, and A Summer's Day. In 2014, he started The Coalition, which was a platform for Indian entrepreneurs to start their own business. He's been, he's been recognized by many publications, such as India Today and CNN, as one of the Indian entrepreneurs to look out for in the entertainment industry. He dropped out of Sydenham College of Mumbai at the age of 15, but at the age of 18, he started OML, 
and at the age of 31, his company is now worth about $13 million. This is the same company that makes apps that tells you what's cool in the city, and the company that budded the idea for the AIB Roast. Welcome to our school, sir. I, I love the ending. Everything boils down to AIB Roast after 13 years of work. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I just met, I think, one of the teachers earlier, and I promised her that she will regret inviting me in the next 25 minutes. So wish me luck. Um, all right. Um, so very quickly, um, I just want to kind of, I, I was supposed to talk about the future of music, but that's a pretty short talk because nobody has any idea what it is. Um, in fact, if anybody ever kind of stands in front of you and talks about future of music, films, entertainment, or internet, and they say something with conviction, they're probably lying because none of us have any clue. We're just all playing along at this point of time. Um, I want to kind of talk about how I started, uh, why I do what I do, and where it kind of all got started. Um, I didn't drop out at 15. I dropped out at 17. So I got two more years of education in. Um, and I actually dropped out for a very weird reason is I was an absolute nerd when I was in school. You know the kid who gets uh, really upset because you got 98 out of 100 and you lost two marks? I was one of that annoying kid. And I dropped out of Sydney because I went there for two years. Uh, in two years, uh, we had one class that took place in Sydney. Sydney is beautiful. Uh, it's one of the best commerce colleges in Bombay. And I realized that basically there was no point going to college and we used to just study for exams and pass. So I actually dropped out because I wasn't learning enough. So it was kind of a weird reason for that, but by this point of time, um, I was running a website which was um, like a Reddit for musicians. You know, that's the best way to describe it now. So it was a big discussion forum called Gigpad. And once you start hanging with musicians, it's, it's kind of fun. You know, you don't want to kind of go do something else, especially when you're 16 or 17, you're traveling with bands and doing gigs. Uh, it seemed like a good career option at that point of time. So I went back to my South Indian parents and told them, I'm going to take one year off just to do this. Um, and in case any of you are ever planning to take one year off education, you can never come back. Just trust me on that, because um, it's extremely hard to kind of come back to an institution once you've kind of gone out and you start doing things, and it, um, you know, it starts kind of paying for itself, and you see the rewards in front of you. Um, so music was never a passion for me, to be really honest. In fact, I didn't really listen to much music till I was 15 or 16. Uh, the first band I ever heard was actually an Indian band called Zero. This is all before your time. You guys were being, you guys were probably like just three or four years old uh, back then. And my initiation to music was Indian artists, which is why I'm so passionate about kind of developing Indian um, artists and kind of working with them. And over the next 10 to 13 years, whatever we've done, it's just with one goal in mind, that I just want as many people to listen to our artists as possible. So be it us making television shows or us doing festivals, everything is kind of keeping that in mind. Um, so when I kind of started out, um, the tough part in India, this is again 2000, 2001 when uh, doing this is, uh, the whole idea of startups, it was t a bad time because we just had the first generation of startups coming late 99, 2000, and everything crashed. So suddenly being an entrepreneur wasn't kind of really cool at, uh, back then. And especially to do something in the music business, I mean, just try and explaining to your mother and father that you're gonna manage rock bands. It's one of the most fun conversations you can ever have. Um, in fact, uh, my folks never understood what I did, so they used to just tell everybody that I'm a musician. So it used to be the awkward one when you know, guests come in and they ask you to sing because they think you're a musician. My dad's pretty cool, actually. I had a big Jimi Hendrix poster in my house. Uh, so a bunch of my relatives from Kerala turned up, and he looked at um, them and he said, this is my son. And that was um, Jimi Hendrix smoking a joint. It wasn't a very uh, pleasant photograph, really. So he has a pretty wicked sense of humor. Uh, which I think uh, some of it at least hopefully I've managed to kind of, uh, it's passed to the genes. Um, for us, a turning point in all of this was actually um, when I started managing bands. Um, I started a record label because uh, people refused to distribute Indian artists, so you had to kind of go do it yourself. Then we had nobody who would make videos for us because we were too small, so I started a production company to go start doing videos for ourselves. Nobody would do events. Um, back then, if 100 people turned up to your show, we'd actually have a big party because that's you know 80 people more than what there was for the last show. Now, of course, the scale has kind of really increased, and expectations and the whole independent Indian independent music scene has kind of really taken off. Um, and for us, somewhere in between actually came the phase when um, I ended up in a festival called Glastonbury. In um, it's close to London. If you ever get a chance, you must go. It's fairly life changing, um, and. I was there kind of watching a band which, at that point of time, to be very honest, I hadn't heard of called Coldplay, who had just released an album. 
Um, and I, I was there with about 170,000 people watching them. And I, d I, I, I didn't go with friends. I just went there with a couple of other people. We lost each other in that big festival. Um, and the festival is basically half the size of Gurgaon. It's 900 acres of land, so it's a massive festival. Um, it's like a city that happens. So I was there with absolute strangers. Just being there in that presence and watching something that incredible was a big experience. And for me, I got obsessed with the fact that this is what I need to bring back to India. And it kind of became an obsession slash life mission that we need to create things of this scale. Uh, because there's something beautiful about a music festival where all these strangers come in, nobody fights, everybody gets along. Um, you know, and of course, then you go back and you know everybody turn back to normal and outrage on Twitter largely. But otherwise, a music festival is a great place to kind of really be, and that's the experience that I kind of really wanted to create. But it's one thing wanting to do something, and there's another thing trying to do something in India. Um, if you want to see the best of government bureaucracy, try organizing a music festival. Um, very recently, I kind of put up a chart which uh, you know a lot of people spoke about which was just, it was a map of how many different things you need to do to get a license, which was going to 30 different offices to try and organize one music festival um, and see the best and worst of corruption and everything, you know, how kind of things really happen. Um, although I think that's something that really makes Indian entrepreneurs pretty hardened in terms of how to get business done because this is what it is. You have to kind of deal with it and you have to kind of keep moving on. Um, and finally, at least we're at a place where we can kind of fight back against it and, you know, try and change things around. Um, Post NH7, probably one of the biggest revelations I had was there was an entire movement that was happening around stand-up comedy. And uh, my couple of friends, at that point of time, they were just known by their regular names, which was Rohan Joshi, Tanmay, Kamba, and Ashish. These guys were all kind of leaving their jobs and starting to become stand-up comedians. And they had an idea of getting together and starting a podcast called the AIB Podcast, um, which kind of started taking off. And suddenly, comedy started getting big. Um, and we decided, you know what, let's just do this as well because it's much easier. There's only one guy and a mic on stage as opposed to an entire band. Um, and AIB kind of was really formed through that. Um, and that, for me personally, was one of the biggest learning experience in terms of the impact that artists can actually have on a large number of people. I mean, at this point of time, be it them leading the net neutrality campaign or something else, it's just um, something that's only seen abroad is how much influence art can have on policy, on politics, on the way young people think. And to be a part of that entire thing was really important. Um, some, I think there was an interview and somebody asked, you know, what was the best part about doing an AIB roast? You know, apart from having 16 lawsuits filed against you, which is great fun. Um, <laughs> for me, the best part was actually pissing people off. Because there is still a large section of people who will actually get pissed off about business that they're not involved in. I mean, all those incredible police complaints were filed by people who were not there. Um, and uh, some of those complaints were just beautiful uh, in terms of uh, there was somebody petitioned the high court saying we're destroying the social fabric of Indian society. Uh, so it, it's, we have it framed. It's, it's beautiful. Um, so it's, um, I think that's the kind of stuff that we love to do is I think as an artist, you have an obligation to stir things up. You're not there to maintain the status quo. Um, and as managers and somebody who kind of really runs the business, that's what we see as our role is to be that enabler, is to make sure that people don't need to know what company they're being managed by. And we're just people in the background. But to do whatever it takes to get your artist's message across to the masses, that's the way we kind of really try and um, really build it up. In terms of, you know, a lot of you are young, and I, how many of you actually want to be entrepreneurs? Like you want to start your own business or do something for yourself? Don't have to be shy, just like raise your hands up. Yeah, the first thing about being an entrepreneur is being shameless. So yeah, you just kind of put your hands up. Which I think uh, a lot of us, uh, in fact, uh, it's really great to see because I've been you know, in colleges and schools and every time I keep going in, the number of hands just keep increasing. That now there is hope that you want to go and do something by yourself, which I absolutely advocate you should do that. Um, you don't have to drop out, but it's not a bad option either. Um, I'm not the biggest brand ambassador of education in general, um, but you know I know this is a great school and um, important things like th basically meeting people from outside, kind of getting their view, it it's an important part of it. Just kind of going by textbooks and everything is something that's never helped me. Um, but it's kind of important to really figure out what you're kind of doing at a larger role. And especially if you're going to be involved in the arts or the music business or comedy or films or anything it, it would be, um, the main thing to do is actually get immersed in it. Um, so for me, before starting a music festival, I was obsessed that I would just keep going to music festivals all over the world. It's a great job, by the way, that we have. For six months we work, the other six months we go and travel and watch music festivals outside. Um, so, you know, once you kind of do that, it's very hard to do any other job, which is why we kind of stuck with the company right now and we have to keep doing it. We've been very pampered and spoiled at this point of time. Um, 
it's over the last three to four years, we've also kind of started realizing in terms of um, once you are at a scale, when I started out, it was obviously it was me and I had one assistant. Now we're at about 120 odd people. Um, we have five, six different companies doing kind of different things. And we've kind of really realized that um, once you're at that kind of a scale, you actually can have a big impact in the way business itself is done. So be it changing standards, be it fighting for policy, uh, fighting for multiple different things. Um, I think it's people who are kind of at the front and hopefully who are at least who perceive to be in the front, they can kind of really make that change. And that's the really important part of it for us as well because I'm, for me, the biggest goal would be that by the time I'm kind of done working in the next uh, three to four years, hopefully, and retire, somebody else wanted to retire as well, so hopefully it'll be the same year. Um, it's, um, it'll be good to see 100 other companies and do what we are. When we started out, we were the only artist management company. At this point of time, there's about 150, 200 odd. That itself is big because if any of you are going out there and want to work in the entertainment industry, there are actually jobs available in the entertainment industry. This industry outside Bollywood didn't kind of exist. Um, coming back to specifically talking about music, um, I think the way it's kind of really going to shape up in general is all music, whether you, we like it or not, is largely going to be free as far as consumers are concerned. All of you are never going to pay for music. You've probably never bought a tape or bought a CD. How many of you ever bought a CD? They're all lying. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. So you'll, you'll literally be the last generation who saw what a CD was and probably bought one CD that you really have. Um, by the time kind of the next generation comes in, there'll be no CD players, and it's just going to be all apps, and people are going to be listening to music there, um, which is great, because in India, what happened, you all understand what music piracy is, right? Yeah, it's what you do every weekend, is exchange music between friends. Yeah, that's what music piracy is. It's the best thing that happened to the music business in India, because what used to happen is we were a monopolized industry, so only Bollywood used to get played. Bollywood still is about 90% of the music business, uh, back then, it was probably 98, 99, or pretty much 100% of the music business. Uh, second biggest form of music, by the way, is uh, uh, religious music in India. It's massive. Um, so, of course, you know, no doubt. And um, as kind of things move forward, I absolutely see that even if there is a musician among you guys, all you need is that one good song and one half-decent, badly produced YouTube video, and that's what kind of really breaks you. I mean, a great example of that is Swapan is a friend of mine who most of our interaction is somebody who we discover on YouTube, I discover, we kind of share it with each other, it goes to 300 other people, and it just kind of just takes off from there. But it's beautiful that all that you actually need right now to break through is talent. This didn't exist in a good part of the last few decades while the music industry was really big. Um, so the future is really bright in that sense for people who are talented, for companies who are new, uh, because the entry barriers have been demolished completely. You don't need to be signed to a major label. You don't need to be doing major festivals. You can have your own audience. You can play, record at home, and do all of it. Um, and I'm hope, hopeful, you know, that every room that I kind of um, speak to or every audience that comes to our festivals, that there are tons of musicians out there, um, you know, who will be there five years from now. Hopefully somebody will be playing um, at festivals uh, that we kind of really produce. For us, one of the things we're trying to do with NH7 is this year, in fact, we're taking it to Shillong. I don't know how many of you would have gone to the Northeast. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful places in India. And uh, if you want to see people who are crazy about music, you must go to the Northeast. Uh, there are levels of craziness. I, you know, you guys might be love music. Uh, they worship music. Um, it's, in fact, I think in all likelihood, pretty much the day that NH7 happens, it's as good as a state holiday because the whole cabinet uh, Meghalaya cabinet is turning up for the festival. Uh, the government is supporting it. There is uh, police support, army support. Everybody wants the festival there to happen, as opposed to try and do it in Gurgaon, where they will find every possible reason to stop that from happening. Um, so it's, I think that's the difference between different parts of India and how you kind of really look at arts. Um, in the long term, just to kind of end, um, I'm pretty sure I'm close to 15 minutes. Um, for us, in fact, for me personally, 10 years down the line, I don't think we'd really like to be known as the company that was a big artist management company and broke these artists. Um, actually, our biggest personal goal will be to try and take arts inside educational institution. Um, because unless that really kind of happens, and I'm not just speaking in terms of entertainment or arts itself, I believe one of the major reasons entrepreneurship never took off, the way it has taken off in many other places, is the lack of design education uh, in the country itself. Is And when you say design, it's not just about um, looking at things and appreciating, but the way you start thinking. Um, it's like, my favorite example is the Pythagoras theorem. You know, all of you know the Pythagoras theorem, right? Yeah, you'll never use it for the rest of your life, probably. Uh, but the thing is, a lot of the things that you learn is to kind of 
logically hone your skills, to try and get better with logic and things like that. Similarly, music and arts play such an important uh, part in the way that you really think. Um, and unless that kind of really creeps in um, forcefully or whatever it takes within the education system, I don't think we'll see the kind of explosion that we really need in terms of beat entrepreneurship, beat the way, beat courage for that matter. You know, the fact of beat debates, public performances, and uh, beat poetry sessions, everything that we're kind of talking about, it develops different parts of individuals which are really important in actually finally building um, what is a great nation. Um, so hopefully, 10 to 15 years down the line, we would have played a significant part. Uh, we're now working with governments very seriously. Uh, we finally managed to get the Delhi government to recently announce uh, to in, uh, include music and arts as part of public school education. Um, and hopefully, we're trying to do that with different governments. Um, and if we can change that landscape, um, then I would say the future of music and future of entertainment in general is pretty bright. Thank you. Um, uh, you said you wanted to bring back some music festivals to India. So do you think you will be ever you will ever be able to bring back a music festival which can compete with the likes of Ibiza or Tomorrowland? No, I'd like to create a festival that could compete with that. I think, um, but a largely um, the moment you said that, I knew you were going to mention Tomorrowland. Um, it's but it's incredible, right? That a festival that happens so far, the whole world kind of really knows about it. Um, I think there are two reasons it may not happen. Um, something of that scale cannot happen without the backing of the state. Um, the state invests a lot of money um, because it's music tourism. You know, people from across the world are going to Belgium to watch a festival. I don't think the Indian government and most governments have raised, you know, realized the fact that it actually is economy. Uh, so unless that happens, you'll never be able to do something of that scale. Um, second, we're slowly getting there. You know, uh, Europe and America have had a culture of festivals since the 60s. We've had that since 2010. So it's just new. It just takes a lot of time. Like how many of you have been to music festivals? Like either Sunburn or NH7 or anything else? Yeah, so it's let's say half the room roughly. In our time, it would probably be n nobody. You know, none of us kind of had seen that. So I think that's absolutely new. We probably went to concerts. That was the biggest thing. You'd kind of go to a concert a year or something like that. So I think once the culture kind of really comes in, then there's more number of people. And then hopefully we'll be able to create something which is Indian. Um, Having said that, 15 years from now, the biggest festivals in the world will be in India and China, just because of demographics and numbers. It's, we're just going to have way too many people. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, sir. What is that one thing that differentiates OML from other artistic management companies? Lawsuits. Um, <laughs> No, I, um, I'd like to believe, honestly, we've uh, actually lawsuits is a good part of that answer because I think a lot of the things that we've done in terms of beat what we do with comedy, beat, in fact, three months from now, you'll see one of the biggest projects we've undertaken on television and things like that. Again, designed to really piss a lot of people off. Um, I think um, we've really pushed the boundaries when it comes to that. Um, it's be it organizing festivals. For example, there are, there's one thing that we do as festivals is um, we don't give complimentary passes. And we don't really bribe cops and lots of other people in terms of when it comes to it. It sounds small, but it's an impossible task in our entire sphere to kind of really pull that off. Um, and the reason is we are always ready to pick a fight. And we realized that some time ago that if you have to kind of really survive in this and grow, you have to be always ready to pick a fight, be it with state, be it with government, be it with whatever forces there would be. Um, but I think that's something that we are known for. and. I think that's one thing that sets us apart is we're not afraid to pick that fight and you know whatever happens we'll see after that. Pick a fight was not the message from that, so kids, please. Yeah. You were speaking about AIB, but like what inspired you and your company or whatever to like to think of AIB and something so out of the box because you know that like the police and the government would never approve of it. It's a good question. Uh, I, I can't give you actually what is the honest answer, not in this room, what inspired us. But um, I think one of the many things that inspired us uh, was the latter half of your question, which is, why shouldn't authority be challenged? Uh, I mean, I think largely most people in this, you know, you're a younger audience, would agree that a lot of our government policies and the way society functions is really regressive. 
You know, you still have debates that you just shouldn't be having in the country at all, be it when it comes to free speech and lots of other stuff. And the reason it remains regressive is because it's not challenged. A great example of that is the whole net neutrality campaign, um, you know, which you know, hopefully you guys have seen the AIB uh, video and stuff. If it wasn't for somebody picking that up, the government would have just passed that law, which is one of the most regressive laws for entrepreneurship in general. Um, but because we made it a public issue, they had to stop it. And now, you know, we crashed the website twice, a million uh, responses the first time. Uh, we did it again one day before from 700 responses. It went to, I think now, 75,000 responses. And no government policy has got 75,000 people, citizens going and responding to it. Um, so I think we wanted to create that platform where we can actually call out on the hypocrisy of the society. So the whole honest series we do, which is honest weddings, you know, honest dating, honest flying, is just the hypocrisy of the society. You know, we all want to be progressive and things like that, but the way marriages are done in India is still so kind of regressive. So which is what we're kind of trying to really bring out. And we also wanted it to be natural, that we don't hold back. We talk the way people do. You know, so be it, you know, we get flack for, oh, sometimes it's abusive, sometimes. No, actually it's not. We just do it talking the way young people in India are, and that's why I think they relate to us a lot more than uh, lots of other content in general. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Um, I'd like to start off by commending on the fact that you opened an enterprise at such a young age. Um, and being one of the youngest, did you ever feel intimidated by your competitors? OK. You have a good voice. You should try and sing, by the way. Um, <laughs> I'm serious. You know, got that marathon going. Um, I think. Um, I was lucky. I was really fortunate because when I started out, we were the first management company, so there was no competition. Like when they, when a band came and said, you know, I want you to manage it, I didn't know what to do, so I literally went to Google and said, what is artist management? You know, it's one, it's one of those things because I had no clue how to do it. I didn't have anybody to talk to, um, so we didn't face that back then. But as we started getting a little bigger and we started doing concerts and events in general, um, what started happening is um, competition in India is very strange. The biggest players try and block you out always in really strange ways. In terms of, I think one of the reasons corruption and a lot of these things haven't ended is corruption benefits the top end of the industry a lot because they know how to navigate the system and it's really hard for newer players to do that, which is why they make sure that the status quo is always, mentioned, uh, always maintained. Um, and that is something we're trying to change because I don't want that to happen. What took OML 13 years should take somebody else two because it could have been done in two years. It shouldn't take somebody 13 years to kind of do it. It's 13 years today, by the way. It was 13 years ago this day that we started the company. Um, you can clap. It's fine. Um, it's um, so I think it was, it was not intimidating because um, I had nothing to lose. You know, I was living with my parents. I had no expense, um, which is very important to be an entrepreneur, as many entrepreneurs would say. Um, I was 18, 19, so I didn't kind of really know fear in that sense. And I think that's one good thing about starting up early is you get to make all your mistakes by the time you're 25. Because what happens at that 25 is, um, you know, life. So then suddenly you have to think about, oh, this is what I'm going to do three years, four years. I'd made all those mistakes by then. So I think my situation is a little different. But yes, it's intimidating. But the thing is, um, I know for a fact that 10 years from now, there'll be some other company who might be bigger than us because there's somebody who's 21 year old who's just hungrier than I am and uh, who has more courage than I have. And that's pretty much how industries function and how it goes. And it's all right. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, how would you rate the professionalism of Indian bands as compared to bands from abroad? It depends. Um, if they're a rock band, being professional is a bad thing in general. Uh, no, I think it's in terms of um, musicians across the world have got incredibly professional uh, right now. In terms of um, just because there is such an organized industry behind them. So literally, what, when we manage a band, what bands have to do is show up at the airport. You know, so everything before that and everything after that is taken care of. Showing up at the airport is a pretty big task for many artists in general. Uh, so, but you know, it's um, they've gotten very professional about it. Second is actually social media. Uh, that's made lots of things accountable in general because people call you out very easily and you know they're shaming and everything else. So if you don't turn up for a show, you will lose fans the next day. So everything is very transparent about it. So I think um, now globally, bands have become extremely professional, um, and I would put Indian artists in par with that when it comes to it because. It's harder for them, so they work a lot harder when it comes to um, working in India. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, so
Sir, uh, what were the uh, what were the more colourful lawsuits that you received after the AIB roast? How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a serious question. How old are you, ma'am? I am 14 years old. All right. I didn't know the word colourful in this context when I was 14. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just stating that. Um, all right. So we got um, lots of funny ones. Sit down. Um, so it's um, just don't sit on your MacBook. It's damn expensive. Yeah. Uh, I think we got a bunch of lawsuits. Um, I think more than lawsuits, I think the first time when, you know, f uh, you know what happens when there's public outrage about something. We knew it would be trouble. We just didn't know it would be so much trouble. Uh, so when news channels start playing it, it was hilarious. Till I think India TV, one of those really shady Hindi television channels came. And there was a headline saying, Desh ka kalang ke <laughs> I be. We just called each other and we laughed out because, you know, it's amazing to be called Desh ka kalang. You know, you made it. You know, uh, it's it's like you're not a cabinet minister unless there's a thousand crore scam behind you. You know, so it's uh, it was just really funny to kind of see Desh ka kalank over there. And then some of the lawsuits is, uh, as a part of a joke, I don't mean to kind of offend or something, but a very different context. We call Salman Khan a Muslim Santa Claus in that. And somebody, and in general in terms of, you know, first you drive over somebody, then you give everybody gifts or something like that. Uh, so it's, and... Uh, Somebody filed a case, and you know why cases are filed, by the way? How will you file out, find, out, find out about the cases is in the press. People file a case just to appear on newspapers. And there's a lot of extortion and blackmail attempt. And somebody would file a case and we'd get a call saying, just pay us money and we'll withdraw the case. And the thing is, there were so many cases filed against us, withdrawing one made no sense. So we didn't pay, you know, we're like, screw it, doesn't matter. You know, might as well just go ahead with whatever's happening right now. But I think um, the Deshka Kalang tag was beautiful. There was a law professor uh, in... Uh, <laughs> Bhavans or some law school who filed this incredible, it was a thesis on the AIB roast, who I think for the first time saw what a roast was, so I think her mind just boggled and you know, she went and like wrote this down. Um, and her students were emailing us saying, you know, she's just a professor, we don't believe in this and things like that. Um, she wrote like a three page thing and she filed a case uh, in the High Court in Bombay, uh, which is where uh, destroying the social fabric of India, and we have now made that our tagline and everything else, destroying social fabric since 2010. So it's, uh, I think, what you do with comedy is whenever something's thrown at you, you just embrace it. You know, let it all kind of really come in. Um, but it's great. I just want to kind of extend it a bit. What's started happening right now is suddenly it's all right to have self-deprecatory humor. You know, in terms of, like when we did a big spoof on Arvind Kejriwal, um, the first person who retweeted it was Arvind Kejriwal. So it just became kind of a validation saying it's all right to laugh at me. And now we've had other politicians kind of really come in and we have now politicians calling us, saying we want to be in an AIB video. Bollywood actors kind of calling us, but we don't usually do it unless there's a concept. I think the Alia Bhatt one was a good example of, you know, just if people are laughing at you, laugh along. You know, that's how you kind of really build it out. So I think um, social destroying social fabric was an important one. Um, there were some Christian associations which filed some beautiful complaints. Um, literally, I think it'll, it'll make a great book at one point of time. And uh, we're actually coming out with merchandise where we are framing the FIRs that filed and we're going to give it out to fans. So it's, you know, if they filed it, you might as well use it. Um, that will further piss them off, you know, and how much fun will that be? So I think that's, that's what it is. I think, sorry, swapping. Yeah. Sure, I think, yeah, we've touched upon, uh, I'll make it really quick, I know we're running out of time, but Coalition is a project we started last year. Um, and I would love for the school to kind of really be involved is what we're trying to do is essentially, um, you know, when you, when you think of the word startup, the first thing that you think of is probably Flipkart, Amazon, or Snapdeal, or everything else. You never think of anything in the creative business as a startup. Uh, you'll never think of uh, somebody who started a fashion label as a startup. I, startup has kind of become equated with the word technology. So Coalition is a program we've started only for creative entrepreneurs. So what we're trying to do is, um, it's a conference. We'll bring, we've been doing it for two years. This year, it's going to be massive. It's going to be in the heart of Delhi. It's going to be 17 different conferences and one massive one with 5,000 people in a stadium. Uh, but we're bringing the biggest entrepreneurs from the creative industry, so people who worked with an Adobe to Apple to some of the biggest Hollywood stars who are businessmen, all of them here to kind of just talk about business. They're not there to inspire you creatively. They're just there to tell you about how to get business done. Um, and we pick the audience. So everybody applies. You can't just pay your way inside. So it's not like you can pay 20,000 bucks and you get in. 
because then all advertising agencies people will essentially land up you know exactly what i'm talking about but here we actually want even the youngest entrepreneur and our goal is actually to try and find people under 25 um, as much as possible. So the first time state is now supporting us, which is why we're doing it in the heart of Delhi along with the state. Uh, because as far as we are concerned, it is actually skills education. This is what they should be kind of really covering. Uh, but typically it doesn't happen. So I think it's a program I would love for young people to kind of come in. Um, it's no cost for you know students who kind of really come in. But over the four days, I can promise you that four days is more than four years of college education in the current state of college education in India for sure. So I think that's what we're kind of really trying to build because we're trying to create an army of creative entrepreneurs in the next seven to eight years. And at the end of it, you get to pitch to investors right there and investors invest in your business right in front of everybody else. So I think that's, uh, this year we're trying to bring about a hundred million dollars of investment in um, at the conference, which will be kind of given out during the conference itself. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today, sir. Uh, please accept this token of our appreciation from our school. So um, today a number of speakers have come before us to share their incredulous journeys and we have sat before them awestruck and inspired. So let us put our hands together once again to thank these speakers. <laughs> oh, better yet, we can thank these speakers by taking, uh, by, uh, making, by taking an initiative to make a change. Um, the variety of speakers here today, from venture capitalists to cricketers, have given us the opportunity to harbor our talents and further our interests in a plethora of arenas. And I'm sure that all of us have been deeply motivated and have realized success in every sphere. I would like to thank all the participating schools and teachers who have taken out their precious time to join us in this Thought Leadership Summit. And our journey only begins here because we must all now um, carve our own destinies and we hope to hear many more voices in Vasant Valley in the future. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes our event today. Um, can we please, can we please just have the schools that have come from um, outside to lead out? Yeah. <laughs> Did. Seated.